friends, welcome back to the Film Alchemist Podcast, the show where we look at movies we love, break them apart, to find out what gives them their magic. I'm your host, Josh Griffey, joined as always by my TV-watching junkie and co-host, Alex Dandino. Good Lord, brace yourselves for misery and depression. Not from us, but from the movie we're covering tonight. But before that, a little business. Uh, please take a second, right now, right this second, leave a rating and review wherever you find the show, especially if that happens to be Apple Podcast app. That helps us out a ton. Uh, finding new people, charts, all that algorithmic overlord bullshit. Uh, we appreciate all of those uh, those of you who do it. Every time we read one, it makes us very happy. Thank you, guys for the help go to youtube subscribe to our channel film alchemist you can see video versions of these podcasts and some other uh projects that we'll be churning out over there so go subscribe now follow us on all the social media you're on we're there too uh and we love communicating with you guys in that vein you can email the show film alchemist pod at gmail.com with ideas for movies you would like to see covered new old double features guest hosts. We're going to be doing more new movies this year. Uh, assuming there are new movies this year. Time will tell, but that's our plan. Uh, so get at us, guys. Uh, we love hearing from you. All right. 2021. 2020's fucking evil brother so far. But we still have to keep hope alive. Um, unlike this movie, Requiem for a Dream. So we decided... To start January with a bunch of New Year's resolution themed shows. Uh, so this would be, I want to quit a bad habit, right? A lot of years it's, you know, I'm going to quit drinking so much, quit cigarettes, quit H. Yeah, I just got to get off the smack. I don't know. Maybe that's your life. Yeah. Um, get off you, that boss skag. Yeah, right. If you can watch this movie and not want to rip your skin off and change your life for the better, um, there are numbers to call. Seek help. Uh, this... <laughs> movie requiem for a dream i have seen it since college i just can't remember when but when i was in college this was a big time mega it was one of those movies that came out and it felt like it left a crater in your mind with which you're like all movies must fill this level of awesomeness um i'm not sure that was my experience today alex walk me through your initial thoughts on requiem for a dream Ooh, boy, boy, oh boy, oh boy. Um, Requiem for a Dream was a movie I saw, and I remember I saw it my senior year of high school. Mm. It was the first time I saw it. That is also the last time I saw it, for the exact reasons <laughs> you just described. It's been 20 years since I watched this movie. Um, that's more than 20 years. Sorry, I graduated high school not in two. It's been 20 years since it was... 15 or almost it's almost 16 years since i saw it um it's been 20 years since it's been made wow you know it's amazing because like this was that movie when you started college that everyone's like have you seen requiem for a dream oh, yeah. and it's always like one of those things it's one of those like lightning rod movies there's a poster of it on someone's wall and people are like what's that all about <laughs> like you just gotta watch it yeah well there was because we went to college and everyone yeah. like brought their collections right so everyone's like trying to show off your gems, right? Like the shit that proves that you're more of a film student than other kids. But you had kind of right, your right. camps, right? So I would say the Requiem kids were also kind of the Donnie Darko kids. That's the category. I would... Then you had your Lebowski guys, your Tarantino uh -huh. guys, right? Like there were these different genres. There are some of us that were just yeah. like horror movie guys. But I think Requiem and Donnie Darko filled a very similar space. Yeah, the, the Requiem guys were very into... As from my recollection, everyone who thought Requiem for a Dream was like the movie, which, again, I want to state this very clearly because we're going to talk about this movie in a way that seems negative in some aspects. This movie is unparalleled masterpiece. Like, this is a great movie. There is nothing yeah. about this movie that I think is bad, particularly because of the way it's made. Like, this is Darren Aronofsky being Darren Aronofsky. Like, that's... This is a second fucking movie too. Like imagine yeah. being a director and finding your voice in your second movie like this. Like Pi is its own thing altogether. Mm -hmm. This is an amazing feat though to to be able to like find your voice as a director like this in this kind of movie in this sort of context. So for me, I've always thought of Requiem for a Dream as it's a great movie that I can never watch again because it's 
so exhausting watching this movie. Uh, skin crawling is yeah. a great way to put it. I honestly just like, it's like running a marathon, man. Like I get to the end and I'm honestly like sweaty and exhausted from watching the movie. Yeah, the difference is a marathon is good for you. This is just fucking agony. <laughs> Right? This is more like having someone who has no teeth slowly chew your dick off and flip you off the whole time. It's yes. horrible brutality. And, so, and that's the thing. Again, I also would like to agree with you. I think this movie is really well made. Some movies, the entire point of their existence is to be... Uh, like You shouldn't watch something of this ilk or you know even like an older one like The Lost Weekend. And be like, what a fun yeah. romp through alcoholism destroying a man's life, right? Like, that's not right. the movie this is. And, no. you know, you can argue the merits of, you know, because I've had this debate with a lot of friends, right? That at the end of the day, a movie's sole responsibility is to entertain someone, right? The movies in their own right are kind of drugs of the masses where life sucks. I hate my job. My wife's snagging me. My kids don't appreciate me. The car tire blew. But I can watch Predator and forget for an hour and a half. Right. And it makes you not, you know, go ape shit and murder everyone around you. Yeah, I agree right. with that on some level, but there is a more artistic twinge, I think, to some people where it, you can really. So I don't have to become a heroin junkie to understand that kind of methodology. And I think sometimes going into those worlds that are either so uncomfortable and so scary or so foreign to you. You know, yeah. that's not always going to be something that's just like, oh, what a lighthearted romp. But it, it can be good and right. cathartic for you in, in a similar way. Or at least that's right. how I look at it. No, I agree. I think entertainment. I agree with you, by the way. I think anytime you step into a movie theater, anytime you sit down to watch a movie, you're you're wanting to be entertained. No one watches a movie for except for us as like a labor of love. <laughs> <laughs> like. Absolutely nobody sits down and watches a movie like, well, I just got to watch it, I guess. Like, I've never sat – if you sit down and watch movies like that, then, I don't know, pick something else. Uh, but to me, there are varying levels of entertainment. Like, I don't watch movies like – I don't watch movies like The Big Lebowski the same way I watch movies like Blue Velvet. Or, sure. like, I wouldn't watch – I wouldn't watch, like, Phantom Thread – Unless yeah. you know, unless I was in the mood to watch Phantom Thread. And if in the and like you're saying, if I'm in the mood to watch Predator, I'm gonna watch Predator. It's fun. It's I think entertaining. the question becomes is how many people are in the mood often to do this? And I think maybe yeah. coming off the times that we are in right now makes it exceptionally hard to stomach. I'd be super curious to know who listens to this show, how many times they've watched this movie. Yeah, and I mean what I would argue about this film, right, is that the the, the style that Aronofsky employs in this film, right? It's very in your face, right? This is not invisible hand stuff. This is constantly reminding you that you were in mm -hmm. a false reality, right? And whether that's to uh, reinforce the drug narrative or to remind you, it's okay. It's okay. This is all fake. Don't get oh, too. Oh, no. See, I don't think that's how it's. I don't th oh, see, I've never I, read I it think that it's way. an extremely important, important double edged sword. Because I think if this movie... Important. Important. It's important. <laughs> right? Back in Prohibition, I saw the damages of these. these <laughs> oh, you're from Coney Island, huh? You're from... <laughs> Back when I was slinging papes, watching men throw their families away on the drink. No. Back when I was tossing boss skag at the locals. All right, all right. You fucking right. comedian pronunciation <laughs> devil. <laughs> Any, what I'm saying is, is that I think what he does, right, is it... Because this is the thing. I, I called this movie to you. I said, this is film student catnip. It's everything yes. we love, right? Because as a film student, you're like, how can I make the movie about me as a director? Me, 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 right? So any beat, you can overly stylize this and that, right? Some people who are film theorists, the more you do that, the more you kind of destroy the, the fabric of what a movie can be. And so you're disrupting, you know, people's experience. In this movie particularly, I think it is so important that not only – because this here's like a great scene, right, that I thought, what a weird fucking choice. So there's the scene, this is early in the movie, right, when um, Jared Leto and Jennifer Conley are laying in bed after some uh, fornication. <laughs> so this is a simple scene that you see in movies sometimes, right? Two people who just fugged look at each other and they're like, man, I like you way more right now. The endorphins are running. The drugs are kicking. 
What a great time to be alive. It's a simple fucking scene, right? Aronofsky chooses to shoot this in a split screen, right? So even though they're right there and just pulling the camera back even a foot, you probably can get them both in just fine. We have that barrier between them. We see Jared Leto's arm move and not match up with his hand that is reaching out to touch her face or her his arm. We can cut in really tight to her caressing his elbow. These, And in a weird way, it's, it's such a, an interesting beat that he pulls out constantly in the movie, right? Because to me, right. that line between them and constantly cutting away from them in the moment should destroy the intimacy of the scene, but it doesn't. So in my mind, what is the purpose that's serving? It is to keep me at arm's length from the fucking whores that are about to happen, right? See, and this is like, I mean, this is a, this is a great example of what like our tour theory does and sort of the general notion of why would you do something like that? Why wouldn't you make it? Why would you make a movie is style over substance, so on and so forth? Because for me, whenever I've of the two times now I've watched this movie <laughs> and anytime I've spoken about it, because <laughs> it's burned in my brain, even though I've only seen it twice. Um, for me, the quick cutting, the, um, the phrase is hip hop montage. They always, that's the way that I always describe it. Cause <laughs> this movie, this movie, I believe I looked it up. It has over 2000 cuts, which most movies have an average of like 600 to 700. So again, the hip hop montage concept is specific to Aronofsky. And like, it's very, like it goes with the music. It goes with the beat. Like it's very specific. So for me, I've always interpreted that as making sure that the viewer knows this is this is how it feels to be on what they're on right now. You're experiencing yeah. the movie the way they're experiencing life, which is why things quick cut. You see a lot of cross cutting. That scene in particular is interesting because it is a very still quiet scene. But he doesn't want you to forget. Like, don't forget these people are literally like waiting for the next fix. Like they're yeah. on their way to being done with this reality. So like. That kind of cutting makes sense to me because it works within the narrative of how he's making the movie. And like, I'm someone who likes auteur theory. I think it's very interesting. It's a fun way to watch movies, especially movies from different kinds of directors, because Aronofsky is a great example of a guy who's developed his style over many years now. And his movies feel very different now than they did when he first made this. Cause I got to tell you, man, I don't remember watching movies that looked like this before I saw this movie. But that, Except for pie, that's which what is I also mean, right. This is film student catnip because there's so much yes. style, right? When you're watching something like Harold and Maud in film school, right? It's harder to see the hand of Hal Ashby than it is Darren Aronofsky, right? It's it's very in your face. It's very intense. It, it has a bit of that Spike Lee vibe, right? I remember the first time I saw Do the yeah. Right Thing, and you're like, oh my god, like something extra is going on, and in your young mind that. You start latching onto that. I think the difference is, right, is I think for film students, you see that and you're like, that can be me. I can make everyone fucking Neil Desai. Right, right. And on top of that, apparently at that age, right, because I think everyone who's in film school, there's an inherent level of your life's just okay. So our our threshold for suffering is so much higher in college where oh you're, you're constantly finding ways to be the victim and life is hard and tragic. Um, I remember right, being right. in, like, my first screenwriting class and you're like, Boy, a lot of us wrote suicide into these short films. Like, you know, it's it's like the whole experience you go through. But what I think is different, is, I think people would hear me say that and think that that's a slight. I don't think it is, right? It is. No, it, it I is would just drawing yeah, to no. your eye, right? Because what this what he does, right? And I think the drugs are a really good kind of stealth subversion of what could be happening, right? So that scene where they're face to face, right? It's not pulling me out like I thought it would be, right? But what it is is there are things that are gross and scary and horrible. If you saw these junkies running around the street, you wouldn't want to run up and wrap your arms around them, right? You'd be like, right. wow, look at that person fucking up. But this right. is a way to go in. So he can, through the style, right, he gives you other things to look at that can draw you in but also let you feel safe, right? Like maybe a better example of this is when Ellen Burstyn – um is starting her diet and she's on this grapefruit diet right and so we see mm -hmm. a grapefruit the grapefruit just disappears the egg is just yeah. shells the coffee's just gone we don't even get to see her enjoy the bites right it's a weird choice right it's just a weird visual choice and it reminds you 
fake, fake, fake. This is fake. And this is not a drug-induced scene, right? This is reality, right? The other two characters are junkies. She's not yet. So by doing this, it's just reinforcing that she felt like she got nothing, like it literally disappeared. Okay, now we start looking at the fridge a little different. So reminding us that her reality is weird, it kind of, again, it has that same thing of we feel horrible for this old lady. You want to be like, just fucking eat. What are you doing? And you, I think that a lot of the that in the early parts of the film are to train your mind to be able to survive the third act. Because if you, if you are all the way in, right, Inception style, this movie will fucking crush you. It would crush yeah. you if you well, weren't, like, like, at arm's length. Right. Well, I think that's a really important thing that you bring up is that this movie does a very good job of using repetition to dull your senses. And that's the thing that I think is most important about what Aronofsky's doing is he – gets in your face like the hip hop montage stuff the quick cuts the like the 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 montage things in general and the split screens are meant to sort of disorient you and like reorient you to the way that these characters are living their lives yeah and then yes once you're used to it and i mean like that i fucking the scene where they start actually making money selling heroin that repetition is very important because what it's supposed to do is desensitize you completely to the action itself. Like, these guys are dealing hard drugs on the pier. Like this is a big problem. Like that's terrifying. They're sitting there under a light and constantly cutting back and forth. You're desensitized to this. So you know what's happening. Cause I don't know if you noticed, but like, especially at the end, the way it's cut is very different than the way it is in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So for me, what's, fascinating and what makes the end of that movie because we'll get to that like the last 30 minutes of this movie are horrible but like not in a bad way by the way <laughs> but like just brutal yeah. but because you're so desensitized to the quick cutting when it gets to that part at the end you're right like you're conditioned and yet the cut is somehow different so it's so much worse and so many different levels it's pretty fascinating like it's it's when, right. for me, like, the the mood changes completely, obvious, like, and it's meant to. And there's even that fast cut with the title, call, the title card. But, like, when Tyrone is in the car with the drug dealers and the guy gets shot and then they have the body cam where he's running, Jesus that's Christ, the yeah. complete – that is the fucking tone shift in the movie. Like, everything gets fucking thrown – everything wow. gets – everything we've seen until that point is literally thrown out the window. Yeah, see, I think – it's the scene to me where nuts. you're like, oh, God, because I there's a version of this movie that I run in my mind. Right. If you took Ellen Burstyn's character out of the film, how would this movie work for us? Right. Because the other three characters are people who are just. And again, drug addiction is a medical problem. Right. It's a chemical imperative. You don't you can't just willpower your way out of it. Right. But the right. other are younger kids that got caught up partying. And now have this problem, right? In a weird way, I think most people who watch this movie, you don't feel as bad for what happens to those three throughout the movie. I think the absolute crushing part of this film is what happens to Ellen Burstyn. Because this is just yes. a mom. And, and again, I think the well, opening of this film is so brilliant, right? That she has to chain her TV to the radiator. She goes back and has bought it from this same guy. She's bought her shitty TV back 25 times, mm -hmm. right? She has that crushing line right she's still trying to talk to him through the door where she's like the chain's not for you it's for the robbers and he's like why don't you come out then and she can't answer right and even to the guy he's like why don't you just fucking report him maybe you can help him and she's just he's all i got but you realize inherently you're like she doesn't really even have that so we set this this portrait of this lady who's just holding on to any bit of decency she can in the the moment right the moment that this movie becomes i think just an exercise in withstanding suffering right is the moment she takes that diet pill because you fucking know you're like the one decent person in the movie right i shouldn't say the one decent person right but you know what I, the, the person who had made it this far i think maybe that's it right you start thinking about what if my mom became a junkie at her age, right? She's like a grandma, and like I watch her play with my kids. What if one day she came over to do that, and she was fucking strung out, like Ellen Burstyn is at the end of this movie, and it's a horrifying 
awful fucking moment, right? So, and I think this gets back to the cutting too, because the repetition, what it also does is it, there are probably, what would you say, five to 10 scenes in this movie that feel like they exist in the real world, right? Man. Unencumbered yeah. by the cutting and the fastness. And so what he does is he never makes it, like even Ellen Burstyn, who is essentially one of us, an audience member at the start, she has the, right. the addictions we all have, TV, eating right. too much, normal addictions, coffee. Once we lose her, we're so fucking untethered in this film. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's the thing that is most important about this movie is without Ellen Burstyn's character, this is a wildly unrelatable story. Because See, just in I general, so too, people. Yeah. Because just in general, I don't know. Like I've never had any sort of, I've never had an addiction issue. I have family members who have, and yes, you're right. It is a medical condition, but this movie runs the mill. This movie without Ellen Burstyn runs the mill of being a drug movie. What this movie really is about is the addiction we have to a better life, and I think that's mm, kind of the crazy yeah. thing is the move when Ellen Burstyn starts losing her grip. That is the real, like, besides, and I agree, like, I really think that Tyrone's, Tyrone with blood all over his face is, like, the movie's tonal shift. The audience's tonal shift goes with Sarah, though. Yeah. And Sarah losing her grip on reality is a big shift because we all know the writing is on the wall for Marion, Harry, and Tyrone. We all know what's going yeah. to happen because, quite frankly, it's not an uncommon story. I have plenty of friends. I mean, like I said, I have family members. I have close friends. I have member of my family who lost their life. And it's just one of those things where you're like, I know what's going to happen and I can't help it. Like either yeah. it's, it's there, but Ellen, Ellen Burstyn, Sarah is, Sarah's accountable for herself in a lot of ways, but it's also one of those things you're like, that could happen. That has happened to literally anybody. Yeah. Well, also hers comes from, I feel like the other three characters, there's a sadness and desperation at times. Right. Yeah. So the scene when she, so they meet, they're on a roof, right? When she yanks the alarm so they can hide, right? And they're, oh, we need extra thrills in our life. There's there's moments where you see these people. This feels like a roller coaster ride with them. They're, they're just going up quickly so they can fall, right? You never fully believe they're going to reach a better place. I think what is really sad about Ellen Burstyn's story in this film is that hers starts at a place of hope, and that's what brings her down. The others feel like they're just on this, again, like an amusement park ride. Hills and valleys, hills and valleys. But again, like you said, mm -hmm. we all know where this story is going, right? This is going to be a crash and burn ending, which the movie tells us many times. Hers is she just wants to be on TV, right? She's this. It's extra weird and sad this time watching it that all she watches is this same infomercial about we're going to get better. We're going to do this and that. Shooter McGavin's telling her how to fix her life. And I'm like, there are how many channels? Like, what is happening? So that was extra weird, too, right? But with her, just just that I just want to, you know, be able to wear that dress that links back to this photograph of the proudest day of my life, right? Back when things were good. Right. That's a pretty relatable, normal thing all of us have seen. And to your point, if we don't have Ellen Burstyn, who's a mom, an aunt, a teacher, whatever, most of us can look at the other three characters and just walk the fuck away. This is the slowest moving execution I've ever seen in a movie. And you just, you know what's happening the moment yeah. she takes that pill. And I think the fact that she's like, I can still make my life better. And that's what leads her to this. He's right. Fucking. It's hard, man. <laughs> it's brutal. It's really rough. I mean, it's always been one of those things. Like when I watched the, like when I watched this again today, I, I realized like Tyrone, I think is the only one uh, Tyrone one might be the only one who actually comes out with a decent enough, uh, <laughs> a decent enough life after this. Like, he we can do our prison. power rankings of who's got a fucking sunny. Yeah, like power. we'll get to that later. But like <laughs> we can we can do the like who has the best deal. But like I've always posited that Tyrone's life could be demonstrably better. But like that is the crazy thing about this movie is that everyone who's in search of this it's not even like the American dream. It's just the dream of better of betterment. You know that I think is kind of 
the sad and terrifying thing of all is that this movie is about like there are no shortcuts almost it's this weird kind of thing because i'm not there's a lot i've spent a lot of time today trying to figure out what exactly aronofsky's trying to say in his adaptation of this book which i've never read by the way i've never read the book i would not claim to have read the book but to me it's obviously about addiction and everything like that but i don't think it's about there's got to be it's got to be about it has to be about more than just addiction and i think that's the thing that i latch on to and i'm willing to like sit through the rest of this movie mm. because of is i have to i have to imagine this is going somewhere besides like that's very bad. Don't do that again. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what the movie's can't reaching be the movie. down for is the why do people get addicted, right? Everyone right. knows these are not good life choices. I mean, I used to, I myself had substance abuse issues for quite a while. Uh, I wouldn't lie and say, like, I'm all fixed up. I did the work. I just had kids and didn't party as much. But, you know, I, I had those <laughs> nights where you're like, I know I'm making a bad choice. And you just said, whatever, tonight's the night. Like, this is the night that's going to be worth it. Consequences be damned. And it's a weird headspace that a lot of us hit where you just start. And I think that's what the movie's getting to. Why are we addicted to TV and eating more? And I think what they're saying is just it, so many of us are just so fucking lonely. And that there's this weird pervasive element in the film, right? Because even Jennifer Conley's character, she has this nice apartment. They say her parents pay for everything. And even her, I mean, it seems like that would be great, right? She's trying to get her fashion line off the ground. But even her, she's just like, yeah, my parents just give me money because they can't give me anything. So just like a kid who needs love and a hug, right? right? Seemingly has everything at her disposal, still falls prey to this. Just because this fucking junkie guy legitimately loves her, right? And she can feel that. And so that is her gate. I think they all have a different gateway drug. Which is the yeah. weird thing, because you start thinking that maybe for uh, Jared Leto, it's his dad passing, maybe. Tyrone, right? His, he told his mom, I'm going to make it in a flashback. Like, maybe he just, she left and she never saw him, you know, make it. And So you never know what these, I think that's what the movie plays with a lot is, why are we addicted, right? Because the easy thing is, oh, it's right. an addiction film. Well, yeah, no shit. That's like saying Back to the Future is a time travel film. Like, yeah, there's a lot of drugs and addiction. But why? Like, why does this right. this fucking being on TV? She doesn't even know the fucking show she's going to be on. This could be on a you're a fucking moron, you know, on ABC right. hosted by Larry the Cable Guy. And she she doesn't know that. She's just excited. And this is the scene of the movie, right? To me, this is the lever scene that we were discussing earlier. This is actually it, I think. So they do the heroin, right? Because uh, they're in there like Goodfellas upswing, right? They're filling the box, as it were. They're like, we just need to test it a little bit so we can make sure how much to cut it. And you're like, yeah, they're fucked. They've already, they couldn't even go like a day without being junkies. That's what, we know their fate, right? There's a scene when they do heroin and they do the typical, like you said, the hip hop montage, right? The lighter, the mm -hmm. sizzle, the snort, the eyeball. They cut that directly into the montage of her grabbing the pills and the coffee. And mm -hmm. you, oh my God. And to me, this was my favorite scene in the movie was the the, the lunch with mom, right? Where he shows oh, up yeah. and he thinks he's got his shit together. Mm -hmm. And he's trying to relate to her and he sees in her what he was, right? And it is... It's just... It's a, it's a horror movie. Like, that, that scene is a horror movie to me. Because this guy thinks he's got his act together. But it's his false love and wanting to make it better right i'll buy you a bigger tv that'd be like someone buying him like a fucking gallagher size heroin needle right it's such a right. an empty platitude and you see her in this state but just because she so desperately wanted love and so we're watching this fucking greek tragedy just of these two people can never give each other what they need but they were the only ones that could have done it for each other it felt like and uh yeah. i think what she says is I'm going to forget the exact phrasing, but um, she's like, you know, I'm somebody now. Everybody likes me right. now, right? We saw the scene when the old ladies mm -hmm. ran into her apartment to fill out her application. Do you see where I sit? Uh -huh. I'm a somebody now. And uh, because of that, she just goes, you know, I like the way I feel right now. And we're watching her jitter. 
And it's all cued off because he hears her grinding his teeth and he just goes, holy fucking shit. And that's the closest yeah. she comes to admonishing him too. How do you know about more about pills than doctors? And you see this crushing, you're like, this is the last scene of of this reality. This story is, this family's decimated after this scene, right? Um, And it's, it's just hard, man. And watching Ellen Burstyn, I was like, that's, most actors never get a scene like that in their whole life. Just no. absolutely rips your fucking soul out. And when they stand up at the end and they're on the far edges of the frame, the just no intimacy. She tries to come closer for a hug and he's like, yeah, we'll come. Me and Mary and uh, talk to Grant. But they're just like, you can feel them like they're magnets that can't get close enough. And then it's over and it's it's the last gasp of, gasp of hope. It unbelievable <laughs> it's it's brutal i mean it's it's the mo- it's it's oddly in a movie filled with tragedy probably the most tragic scene to watch a character tell him it's what it's for me like it's harry telling himself all this stuff he already knows and i think that's the thing that's the worst is it's just like there's just no way around it man like you're you're sunk like you know what you're telling her is for you but you're just gonna keep yeah well, then it's, he uses it as a false trigger, like, oh, I better go shoot up. And it's like, you sack of shit. You yeah. bastardly. <laughs> like, but in a way, too, it's that's just kind of how a lot of life is for some. And I think this gets because that that plays right into the assassination. So these scenes right in a row, you're like, oh, fuck. And to your point, right? The assassinations where like, oh, now there's blood on people's hands like. The game has changed. People aren't escaping this story, which we kind of know. But this is a really firm flag in the ground. Uh, prepare for fucking annihilation, which is what the yeah. second half of this movie is. is just absolute Ugh. decimation of any joy in your heart. <laughs> I can tell you the last I remember watching the first time I saw this movie. And I think it was with uh, I think it was with Rob, who was one of the guests for our Halloween month. The guy who uh, Rob who watched a season of The Witch. Uh, with us and I honestly like we got done watching and I was just like I'm exhausted man like that (laughs) last 30 minutes of this movie is the most exhausting experience I've had in a long time just Mm -hmm. dealing with the like watching it is bad enough because like everybody is going through something horrific yeah like Tyrone and Harry are trying to Tyrone and Harry trying to get this heroin from the distributor, Harry's arm is becoming horribly infected, which I think might be the grossest thing I've ever seen in a movie. <laughs> like by far one of the grossest things I've ever oh, seen in a movie. Yeah. Um, and then Marion is, we'll get to that. Uh, and then, yeah, Sarah's like lost her grip on reality. She walks outside like mm-hmm. that shot of her, like walking outside. Like, I think it's sped up film. Like, holy fucking shit, dude. That is... And there's actually a segment before <sighs> that that kind of sets them on this path, right? Like, so some mm-hmm. of the the scenes of stillness in this movie are really interesting to me. Because one of them you get... You get two of them with um, Leto and Conley, right? So one is when he comes in and he essentially is like, Hey, you should go fuck your therapist to get us money. And yeah. that total loss of innocence, right? The one thing they had, because we saw him earlier, like, don't go to dinner with that guy. Throw him out. Yeah. Now he's asking her to do it, right? You see what this drug is taking from him, right? And taking from them. And that scene is fucking horrifying. And that that's yeah. one of those still moments. Them on the, the edge of the bath, side by side, but away from the camera, right? We both know the decision they're going to make. But the implications of that. So then she goes and has dinner. This guy fucking grabs her hand. We get one of those awesome flashback or flashaways that they do where people imagine yeah. what they want to do and she stabs him and you're like, yeah. Oh, no, that's not what happens. Instead, no, that's not this what's happening. fucking grease ball, just no shirt on, just paws on her. And it's not sensual or romantic. He's, he's gnawing on her like we just watched him do to his food. Yeah. And she just comes that's back. That's an interesting cut, she gets too, her man. steady cam shot, right? Very much like Tyrone's. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's kind of the end of her previous story, right? When yeah. she comes back into that apartment, 
And they sit on opposite ends of the couch. And they just sit there. And you just sit in that fucking silence, right? For a movie that's constantly keeping you on edge. Because I was telling Amy, the weird thing about watching it today is it, and this is part of the, the masterful craft of the film, is it feels like I'm being caught in a tractor beam. And every time I yes. want to get my fucking feet on the ground, they're like, that's a niche niche. You're coming with me to another horrific event you don't want to experience. <laughs> like, I feel like I'm totally yes. unable to be in control, which is very yeah. rare. I mean, I think that's that scene, the movie whisks oh. you away. Yeah, in a horrible, horrible yeah. way, right? And that scene is one of those rare times where you feel like the weight is now pressing you down. Oh, now my feet are on yeah. the ground. Whisk me away. Get me out of here. They're not I saying mean, anything. The, it's horrible. You know, that scene's also really fascinating because when they're at dinner, like the ASMR that's happening where he's between him, like eating and the, the clinking plank, of silverware yeah. and shit. I drive a Dodge Stratus. And that then, kind of shit. Yeah. Yeah. And then that hard, <laughs> then that hard cut to him just naked. You're just like, fuck, dude, this is not okay. Like things are, I think that's the thing that I admire the most about the movie just like from a filmmaking perspective is you're sitting there and watching this unfold. And like you were saying, it, it just feels like you're being, you have no time to stop and breathe. And that's why I think the end of this movie is so exhausting yeah. because everything happens. It's not necessarily at a breakneck pace. It happens at a speed with which there is no measurement for. Yeah. You have no concept of time or space. Things are just happening. Ludicrous and speed. I think that's the space <laughs> That's exactly ludicrous speed. <laughs> well, it's, it's just that's all the plaid thing. out it's, there. It's intermixed with scenes where you so desperately want to get away, right? Like a mm-hmm. great example of this is when Sarah makes it to the TV building, or when because yeah. Sarah's Sarah has uh, Ellen Burson has the the most interesting time dilation to me, right? So mm-hmm. there's the doctor who comes in, right, and she's sitting there like something's wrong something's wrong and he's just blah, blah, blah. the doctor who prescribes her the fucking pills who never makes eye contact with her once she's not even a human being to him and then later when we see her inhumane treatment you're like well what's gonna happen to that little fucking cue ball nothing nothing ever happens to those fucking guys uh <laughs> but yeah so her time dilations i think are the most interesting and i think maybe because she's new to it right the others are experienced drug addicts so maybe they're right. more used to it, right? But hers are always more jarring in how they whip us to and fro. And again, there's a lot of times when she's super slow and everything's fast and vice versa. Uh, it is. I mean, I I don't know what to say. about the, It gets uh, watching her have her Joker moment into the her apartment becoming a hellscape. Where the her set her house is the set of the TV show, and that her and Shooter McGavin, her idealized self, break out of the TV just to make fun of her knickknack collection is one of the most soul crushing. Like they didn't even make fun of her. Like you fat pig, you disgusting no. sack of shit, you smell bad. That dress is ugly. They pick up her knickknacks and make fun of them. So like, that is some deep rooted uh, self no, abuse right there. <laughs> it's fucking. I mean, horrible. it's that. I mean, and like everyone always talks about the fridge coming to life, and I'm like, that is the least. You know what the weirdest thing, thing I watched in. today? Is I was like, is the fridge her inner angel? Like, is the fridge like, come oh, over totally. here, fucking eat something, Jesus Christ? Eat me. Yeah, the fridge is like, I'll bring you in here with the calories. <laughs> but she runs away from it and loses her last chance at saying, I think the fridge is the good guy. He's just like, for the I think the fridge fuck. might be an angel. Yeah. I've got a couple ding dogs in here. An and angel on high. Yeah. <laughs> it's. Oh, God, dude. It's so brutal. And just yeah. like. Yeah. And then every, yeah, everything she goes through the entire time dilation, like it just happens so fast. Yeah. And you're just like, this is. Ugh, well, it does. But then there was also a point in the movie when I go, oh, thank God it's over. Because my son came home from school. This is what I was watching it. And my son walks in from the school bus and I'm scrambling for the remote. Almost flipped my coffee over. So I'm like, he can't see a frame of this film. And I maybe I should show it to him. Pet Cemetery style, right? And be like this for your own good. Look how bad it is yep. if you do fucking grown up stuff. But anyways, I'm like scrambling to pause it. And I was like, oh, thank God. I was like, the kid will go upstairs. He'll play with his brother. I'll watch the dildo scene, and this thing's over, right? This thing will wrap up. 
I paused it. And I was like, oh my God, there's another 30 minutes. It was, I couldn't <laughs> believe, it was probably one of the saddest I've been in months. And that's coming out of 2020, yeah. mind you. Where I was just like, how is there 30 more? How much more can these poor fucks suffer? Because once Sarah gets mocked on the train and gets yeah. laughed at in the fucking studio, well, not even, the people in the studio aren't laughing. They're just looking at her like she's this hideous monster that they're responsible mm -hmm. for as well. And she gets carried out by the cops. It, it was just so much for my heart. And you're just, this is over, right? No. Yeah. 30. No. More. Minutes. I couldn't We got to see it. how everybody else is doing. I couldn't believe it, man. <laughs> it's, I mean, I'll say this. Like, everyone always talks about this, the Marion scene. Because, like, I actually think the scene before it where she meets Big Tim, Big Tim for the yeah. first time and he's like, I know it's pretty, baby, but I didn't take it out for air. That might be the most like – that's like super degrading. Well, that one I mean, too because she calls him and hangs up and immediately yeah. – her. so her, her last chance was so short-lived. And once she makes that deal with Tim, you're like, well, I know the rest of her story for at least – as right. long as this movie's gonna go, it just sucks. It just, it just sucks. She has even her therapist. The therapist mentioned that they have done this multiple times before. So that's a. Right. I mean, it still sucks that her own amour asked her to do this. But the the Tim thing is different and more vile. Yeah. Well, it's that, and then the end result is like her final. Like I can tell you that of all the things in this movie. The thing that sticks with me and makes me most uncomfortable is her final shot, which is when like, her fetal position shot where she's like smiling with elation as she crawls up with her bag of heroin. And I'm like, that is the most fucked up thing this movie had to offer me Yeah. until today. Well, uh, that, that was burned in my brain yeah. until today. It's really, and I can tell you, it's, it's a beautiful summation of the film though, right? Oh, Which yeah. is no, just it's... the basic human carnage that is left behind in this film. But because she's the only one who's still getting a fix, she's smiling. Yeah. The right. others... She's the only one... Horrifying, right? But she's Although, smiling. She's smiling, but, like, it's short-lived. Like, that's the thing that's so terrifying is, like, the smile is so short-lived and it's under the guise of, like you're not smiling because something good happened to you. You're smiling because you have a momentary like solace yeah. in this fate of, of the world just fading out. Yeah. But like the other, th and I mean, honestly, like that was the most harrowing thing until today. Like, and I don't know, I think it's because I have a kid now, but like the Tyrone fetal position shot hit me so differently because he's like going through withdrawals and everything. And then he's remembering his mother. And, like, they're just, like, sitting there holding each other. And that's, like, how I, like, sit on the couch with my kid and, like, watch Disney movies. I'm just like, oh, my uh, God. Yeah, this felt like, like I had been abducted ugh. and was being forcibly milked. You know what I mean? Where it's just, come, come, come. Every and time. it's just these greasy fucking white Wall Street types and the sweat. And when they cut to Ellen Burstyn being shocked, you're like, if I had seen ugh. this for the first time today and we weren't doing a pod, that would be a shut the movie off. It's yes. so... And then they were fucking cramming tubes down. I mean, it's... And they're just, come, come, come. And he's getting his fucking arm chopped off. And Tyrone's collapsing and throwing up as he's forced to pound rock. Because I don't know. You could say that Tyrone has the best outlook because he might get clean and oh, escape. Yes. Also, he is... Tyrone is the only one who will... Now with a major felony in the southern penal system. So probably... Yes. Probably not the end of that tale. I'm not saying Jesus it's age. a great... I'm not saying he's in the best position for himself, but he's certainly, of all the characters, possibly in the best position to recover. Well, this is the thing. You're it's like, a life of dealing horrible. with whatever's going to be horrible in that southern jail will seem better than the fucking nightmarish, drug-induced fucking hell that we just sauntered through. So in a weird way, oh you're like, God. Hey, oh, my God. You know a scene that I had never remember? Yeah, them just yelling, come, come, come. That, like, got me. I was like, I'm ashamed that I've ever come 
I'll never come again. <laughs> I'm not jerking off anymore. That's someone's daughter. Like I had like grown up emotions watching this today. I hated yes, it, right? Absolutely. It, it made me so miserable. But then the end, this is the thing. This movie has like Return of the King shit going on where it's like, stop, just in. <laughs> like you could have ended this movie in an hour and gotten more in than most movies, but it keeps going, right? So there are a couple moments of just, let's just make this worse, right? Let's get the knife in and dig it a little more. So when he's in jail, right, uh, Jared Leto, and he yeah. calls her, and she's like, can you come home today? Oh, And he's like, yeah, I'm coming, I'm coming. And we know that they know that that's a lie. She's about to go to the fucking uh, Wall Street Bronco Buster party. His arm is fucking falling off. Like, but that little moment. Of her just if he shows up. Because that, that's one of the things in this movie that kept getting me is how much these characters delude themselves into hope, right? Because there's the scene when they take the bo- uh, he takes more money out of the box to get drugs or whatever. And uh, Tyrone gives him that look. He's like, don't worry, man. We'll fill it up again. It'll be like last summer. And you're like, you poor sad fucks. You sad, miserable fucks. Like, you don't even know that you're getting crushed under the wheel. And it's, it's fucking horrifying. But the one today that really got me, a scene that I absolutely had blanked out of my mind. Sarah's friends come to visit her. And they look at oh, her. Oh, yeah. Or what the what's left of her, right? The husk of her. Right. Which in yeah. a weird way, I was like, she looks more back to her normal weight. She doesn't have the big fake orange hair. My Nana used to do that, too. That weirds me out to this day. She used to have like a big fucking Lucille Ball orange beehive shit she was always going for. Yeah, But anywho, they see her, and she goes back into her room, and they're on the bench just weeping and hugging each yeah. other. And that, I started uncontrollably crying at that beat. Of all the beats in the movie, that was the one that just, like, it broke me all the way. I mean, it's, because that's, 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 because that, that's us. Like, that's, that's, I think, the thing that hurts the most is like when I watch stuff like that and especially that scene is I've been that person like just sort of helplessly sitting there being like there's something I can do yeah man I can't do anything for this person short of no there's no explanation like I've had those moments where you're just like there's no explanation for this you have to sit in this horror it's (laughs) I mean that's what I feel like for the last 10 minutes you're just like this was sad And, and you know what That's what Aronofsky did to us. He didn't give us any more comical grapefruit claymation. He just fucking rubbed our faces in it. And I mean, yeah, to your point, it's the only thing he gave me at the end that was like a little bit. Oh, this might be something to take away is when Leto has his uh, dream, right? She's on Uh the pier. He's screaming the name, but no sound is coming out. But Jennifer Conley's gone. And then all of a sudden, someone jumped off the roof into an alley. In my mind, I was like, who was that supposed to represent? I thought it was Jennifer Conley after the fucking orgy. Yeah. But then we see her smiling at the end, right? So, because he's like, she's not coming back. She's gone or whatever. And I think just his idea of her is gone, right? So I was like, at least there's a moment to like sit and do some art house stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it, it was just nice to not be doing all the other shit for a minute. It's a really good movie that yeah. is just un unrelentingly brutal, especially at the end. Yeah. But it's like that's what Yeah. It's the lessons but I can I can tell this story. I had a cousin in my family who had a heroin addiction. Yeah. And I remember seeing him at a funeral for someone and just being like th- it was the same like feeling of emptiness I had watching this movie. It was just like there's nothing I can do. This person is just this person. There's nothing, there's nothing else. Yeah. And like, you know, luckily my family, like we, they helped clean him up. He's, he was okay. He's been living a good life and he's, he's recovered and everything. Yeah. But it's one of those things where like you see, you see that and it's just the despair you feel is un it's unrelenting. And that's yeah. exactly Requiem for a dream is this amazing piece of art that is unrelenting and yet, and you want to look away the entire time, and you cannot. Yeah, and I think that 
is one of the best points though right is this is us being able to play with the scary things in life at a safe distance because yes. that's the thing like you seeing your cousin like i mean I, yeah i've had a lot of friends i was just telling you we have a friend right now who's going through a lot of this. and it's hard because when you see people like that in that moment your first thought is they're too far gone there's nothing to do and that's when they need you the most right but something in us is saying nope nope it's over go away and i think that's the tragedy of this movie and why the ellen burston character becomes so important is i think it's easy to relegate someone to oh they're a junkie right they're an other they fucked up right now they gotta pay and i think this movie is one of the best examples right where she's not a person who did anything bad right dieting was pretty hard she wanted to lose weight without putting in a lot of work and you're like yeah, right. I'm like that in my mid 30s. She's fucking yeah. 70. Like I get it. It sucks. I live right? my life like yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah. she she, you know, makes a small bargain with the devil and this and that. And I think what this movie does is it lets us get close enough to see that there are uh human beings piled up in this wreckage, right? And especially in the world we're in today, there's a enormous problem with this going on. And uh, you know, I think that the humanizing element of what really is this kind of art house in your face experience that still is somehow very intimate and immersive. That's the trick that he accomplishes that I find most fascinating in this film. Because usually the more shit like that you do, it's pushing us out of the frame. But this one fucking pulls you all the way into where by the end, you're like the little girl in the ring. You're just like, get me the fuck out of here! Right? It's, I mean, it's a masterful... <laughs> job that he accomplishes uh yes. there's a good chance this is the last time i'll ever watch this movie in my life um, i would agree with that there's yeah. a very good chance in fact i can almost guarantee this is the last time i will watch this movie. i love darren aronofsky he might be my favorite modern filmmaker at least he's up there right in like a select few so i feel yep. like there's gonna come a day down the road where he's gonna drop a new movie i'm like Oh, that's awesome. I got to go back and watch all of Aronofsky's filmography and I'll get caught maybe one more time and then curse the gods. Nope. Or I'll wait till I'm a really old bastard. And all I have left nope. is my big giant black hole of a TV that my ungrateful bastard sons left me. <laughs> and then I'll watch it and feel comfort and solace. I can tell you right now, I will never watch this movie again. I'm almost positive. It's burned in my brain, yeah. which is why I never have to watch it again. It, it feels is, like one of those, maybe watch a YouTube clip of the, the montage and be like, oh, yeah, I remember that, that cool style yeah. he was in. I can always watch clips and feel the emptiness I feel when I watch this movie. <laughs> <But> like, <laughs> this feels like uh, this movie will be like behind the I elevator mean, doors in The Shining. And it's like you press that button and you're getting all the carnage back. <laughs> I mean, I actually, uh, a few years ago, Clint Mansell, who did the soundtrack, did um, a show at um, the Largo out here mm -hmm. in L.A., and I went and saw him, and even him and the Kronos Quartet playing this music made me anxious. Everything about it made me anxious. Oh, this used to be like, our fucking jam, though, in college. We used to smoke pop oh, to yeah. this and be like, oh, God, we just, like, we get it. We get human suffering. You know us. Middle class white kids in film school in Indiana. We know the deep sorrows of the world, and it's it's amazing. But this soundtrack is burned into my mind as much as the movie. Oh yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, anything Clint Mansell. I mean, look, I've watched every Aronofsky every Aronofsky movie at this point yeah. without fail. Like I, the the Fountain is one of my all time favorite movies, and I have no idea why, but I can tell you that music has again, and this is like. This is an auteur thing. Aronofsky understands the the audio the uh, the the audio sensory that he understands about how people's brains work when it comes to music, when it comes to sound effects and sound design in general is unparalleled, unmatched. There's no movie he has done that does not have a I don't have a visceral reaction to the and not just the soundtrack but the there, sound design in general. All of them. There is a really fun double feature. It puts your auteur theory. It would be fun to have the auteur theory debate if we watch this and Mother back to back. And to <laughs> me, Mother is the uh, Chappelle show equivalent of when keeping it real goes wrong. It's yes. not that I think that's oh, like an absolutely horrible movie, but there are so many 
weird things in that film that I was like, what? What? <laughs> and so it's like, I feel like this one is peak where everything just clicked. It's just not yeah. very in- enjoyable or entertaining, right? It's just like, well, look at that craft. It'd be like looking at someone's got, like, Kevin Spacey's character in Seven, like, wow, really good craftsmanship on that razor dildo. Well, like, but, right? but, but see, that's like, like the thing that about... rips your guts out. Right. Well, that's like the other thing, too, is like when you get older and you're not in film school and auteur theory becomes like that thing you know about. Well, also, it's easier- everyone you ever worked with who talks about it, you're like, oh, that cock. That guy who yeah, thought that my course. job didn't matter. On set. <laughs> right. Well, that's like the whole thing, though, is like, look, I, I'm this goes back to like fucking Hitchcock and all kinds of sure. shit. But like, it's one of those things where, like, I think it's fun to see people. Yeah. And that just goes with people working with the same people continuously. Like, Maddie Lubatique's been this guy, Ben Aronofsky's DP since, like, I think the beginning. Yeah. So, like, it's very rare that he fo- that he functions outside the group of people he likes working with. So, again, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. I'm never watching this movie again. But it's, you know, if we I'm have to watch it with Mother, maybe. <laughs> the only thing I will keep from this movie is I was this close to doing a joke on my wife today (laughs) because right after i watched it i went and worked out and i was in the shower and she came in and i was like is this an appropriate moment to do that i know it's pretty but i didn't pull it out (laughs) i was like is this something at my older age that my wife will appreciate and this is how i know i'm a mature man i thought it i played it out in my head had the laugh internally didn't do it didn't exactly. say it to her. I didn't want to infect her. <laughs> See, and like about. that's and you know why be and you know what happened is you thought about it and you're like, oh, that is really funny. That'd be really funny between us. And then like you thought about more the context by which it happened. You're like, oh, never mind. That's yeah. horrible and terrible. Yeah, in my mind I'm like, stop taking any joy from this movie. Whoosh, whoosh, I whip myself over. <laughs> also, I love how Flagellate. she's gonna be like, Hey, I heard your story about how mature you were. Thanks for sparing me and then telling the entire internet. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, you win so, some, you lose some. That's the story of Requiem yeah. for a Dream, I guess. That's that's it. That's enough. That's, My fucking that's soul the moral. is tapped out. Yeah, Jesus H. Uh, we'll be back next week with some lighter resolution. Fair night crawler. <laughs> Just <laughs> really sinking into these abysses of human soul. Um. We do have some cool guest features coming up. Uh, We're trying to work on some of that. Please leave a rating and review. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Film Alchemist. Find us on all the social media you're on. Email the show, filmalchemistpod at gmail.com. Again, we'll be back with Jake Yellenhall in Nightcrawler. Until then, I'm Josh Griffey. I'm Alex Dandino. 